your grace and your goodness. Lord, bless tonight in this Bible study. Lord, and uh, Lord, maybe a little bit of, of uh, ex exhortation, dear God, and just help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Then, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and uh, we'll read a little bit further, but I want you to note the fact that he was afterward, the Bible says, and hungered. I want you to uh, understand that Jesus lived in a body. He was God incarnate. He was not uh, a, a third person or a secondary member of the Godhead. He was God incarnate in a physical body born of a virgin's womb, and the Bible says there's three instances where Jesus gets hungry. And, there's, and, there, and you might wonder, we might wonder, well, why is it that the Bible uh, talks, why, why did Jesus fast for 40 days? And you, if you'll study the scriptures, you'll find that Moses fasted for 40 days. That means 40 days he went without food, 40 days. Elijah went without food for 40 days. That, if you think about that. Now, most of us, if we go without food for four hours, we lose our minds. Uh, much less to comprehend the idea of 40 hours. But I, wanted, I want us to think on something tonight that's, um, that's not very much, uh, not, not something that we speak about very much. And um, sometimes... Uh, I'll, I'll shy away from it because I feel like people think that I preach on this a lot or that I mention it a lot, but I don't really, and not as much as I should. The Bible says, what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This, this body that God has given us, it's the only one you're ever going to have. You, you, can't, you can't go and trade this body in and someday and say, uh, can I get a new one? Now, this is something that I, I, I preach to myself, first of all. I preach to my wife. I preach to my kids. I preached to Bub this morning when I walked downstairs, and he slumped over on the couch sideways, even though he went to sleep reading his Bible, which I commend him for doing. But God, God designed and God ordained nighttime, if, unless you have to work a third shift or something, God ordained for you to lay down, and rest. He said, Woe unto you that set up, eat, and eat the bread of sorrows. He said, God giveth his, uh, to his beloved, God giveth sleep. Uh, sleep is a good thing. Why is it a good thing? Because that's when your body regenerates. That's when your body uh, re revives. You have to rest. You have to rest your body. Um, I've got an old truck out there that's got 185,000 miles on it. And I, I like that truck, but I feel bad for it sometimes because it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't like heels. And if I got a load of stuff in it, that little six-cylinder in that full-size pickup truck, doesn't, it doesn't like coming up the hill, and it doesn't like a load. And I had a load of rock in it this morning, and yesterday we had a load of junk in it. I don't know what we had in it. And uh, we had all kinds of stuff in there, and that truck, just you could just feel the agony. And, uh, and I, I, when I get out and I, I'd open the hood up, Brother Chris, and say, let me let some of that heat come off of that hood and cool that engine down a little bit. Why? Because that truck gets weary. It'll only take so much. It only takes so much, and it'll it'll blow a, blow a gasket. It'll blow a seal. Uh, it'll blow the engine, and that's the end of it. The transmission will blow out, and your, so your your body, your body, my body, the only body that I have, God ordained, and and God commissioned us to take care of this body. This body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's that's the reason why uh, the Bible, when it talks about drugs, the Bible talks about witchcraft. And uh, talks about sorcery. Uh, the word sorcery in the Bible is almost the same word as a, as a drug pusher or a pharmacist even. Uh, God, didn't, God didn't design you to get sick. God didn't intend for us to get sick and pop a bunch of pills. The first, the first place you take a pill goes to has, to has to sort through your liver. And your liver says, why in the world did you just stick that ibuprofen in me? And, and, it, and, and it, it really, it just wears your body out. You, you say, well, it makes me feel better, but it really doesn't. Uh, God ordained for us to take care of this body. And there's one word that I want to talk about tonight, and that's about control. 
control. Look at first, uh, first Corinthians chapter number seven, if you would. I want to get this out of the way real quick. First Corinthians chapter number seven. Let's look what the Bible says. It'd be a shame for me to talk about this and not make sure I, I hit this point also uh, for anyone listening. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, you don't think that's talking about married people, do you? A married man and woman are supposed to touch each other. If you're not married and you're a man and woman, God says you're not supposed to touch each other. That means keep your hands off of each other. It means keep your hands out from places where they ought not to be. It means don't have sex before you're married. It means stay out of the bed together until you're married. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. That's what the Bible says. You say, but it's so difficult. It's so difficult. Someone will say, boy, I just got these urges. You know, you know God gave us those urges? I'm going to show you something in the Bible. I want you to see this. Nevertheless, he said, to avoid fornication. You say, what's fornication? That's sex outside of marriage. That's looking at junk. That's acting on junk. That's touching, rubbing, feeling, all the rest of that stuff. He said, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own what? Who does it say should have a wife? A what? We'll say that again. A man. That's a hard thing to find in these days. Let every man have his own wife. I hear all the time people say, boy, that fella, he would have done good, but he just married good, and the woman messed him up. You know, I get tired of hearing that, and it, whether it's true or not, I'm just telling you that a man ought to be a man, and he ought not blame his wife if he's a loser and a failure, all right? Let every man have his own what? Wife. Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have what? Her own husband, not someone else's. Man, men aren't supposed to have someone else's. Uh, I, I, I showed the boys a picture today of a man it's in, in eternity now. And, and I, I showed, there's another one that's on his way there in, into eternity. But a man younger than me who once, who once uh, traveled this country and, and, and headed up a, a, a major missions program he was going to uh, lead missionaries, and they had it all figured out, and they were, going to, they were going to reach the entire South American continent in 20 years, build churches, all these things. He had a team of people under him, had a wife. They had several children, and one day he decided to have another woman. Fornic committed adultery against his wife. The fellow became ill. He just died this past week. Younger than me. That, and, and listen, I'm going to tell you something. You can't play around with sin. The Bible says every sin that a man commits is, is, against, is outside, but fornication is against his own body. You know what? You're destroying your body when you fornicate. You're destroying your mind when you fornicate. You say, why is that such a big deal? Because God says so right here. I have, I have no doubt in my mind I could show you another picture of a man two years ago with his wife smiling happy. Today, two years later, an old man. But he looks a lot older than he ought to look. You could hardly recognize him. Why, one day, one day he was alone with a young woman. Couldn't control himself. A man in his, a, a, a seasoned man, an old man, so to speak. Found himself alone. Couldn't walk out the door. Couldn't get out the door. Wouldn't, wouldn't leave. Wouldn't leave the situation. Let things become heated and fornicated. Committed adultery. A grown man. A preacher. Wife and, and, and children. Fifty miles from here, the, the man that stood and did an ordination service where I uh, after I started to preach, did an ordination, signed my Bible, pastored a church of thousands of people, preached to hundreds of thousands of people in his life, is in a, in a prison 40, 50 miles from here, and he'll be there uh, for who knows how long. Because he couldn't keep his hands off of a young girl. And that's where he ought to be, too. I mean, it, there's, it's, it ought to be more so than that. God didn't ordain to lock someone up. There is a death penalty in the Bible. 
But in all intent and purposes, you say, well, I can get by with it. No, you'll die. The Bible says every man, every man, every way a man is right in his own eyes, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. So I'm, you say, I don't like that. Listen, go ahead and kill yourself. Go ahead and commit suicide. Go ahead and fornicate. Go ahead and live wickedly. Go ahead and, 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 and live a, a crude life. Go ahead and throw it away. You're killing yourself when you do that. Now, I'm telling you, we live in a world today that encourages the opposite. They encourage adultery. They encourage fornication. They encourage and even to go beyond, and I'm not going there, but they encourage sodomy and all that type of wicked stuff. Don't, I mean, listen, that's all, uh, all of that is, is a sin against your own body. It's destruction of your own body. Now, it says here, let the husband render unto his wife do benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband that means god says husband and wife once you uh once you're a man and and once you have a wife then you're to take care of your wife and and uh, meet her needs and render unto the wife due benevolence and now listen we're not talking about fixing cupcakes here all right we're not talking about fixing breakfast we're talking about a husband and a wife and a marital relationship and he said to the husband you take care of your wife and then he says, but the, and the wife, it says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. Again, God puts the man first in order there. A lot of men say, well, you know, it's my, my wife's responsibility to take care of me. First of all, man, it's your responsibility to take care of your wife. Amen. We've, we've, got, we've got a lot of our problems in marriage is because men uh, don't lead. And this right here is an area where men don't lead. Men are selfish, and they don't lead. And God said, first of all, man, you take care of your wife. Now, that, that's Bible. Now, look what he says. Uh, Let the husband render to the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. He says, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. That's one of the most overlooked verses in the Bible. And it ought not just to be that a preacher preaches it when he's been out in the sun all day. But listen, he says to, he says to this people, Here, here's, a, here's a couple, a married couple, that are so spiritual, and I mean that. I mean, this, this is a married couple that are so spiritual that they're, they're praying about a matter and they're fasting about a matter, and, a, and included in their fast is this agreement as husband and wife that they'll, they'll not come together as husband and wife. They're going to abstain from one another and physical relationship as husband and wife and the Lord tells the preacher here to say to that couple, if that's what you choose, you set a, a definite time when that's going to end because I don't care how spiritual you are. And if you, even if you say you're so spiritual that you're going to pray and fast and abstain from physical relation as a husband and wife, you must set a time where you're going to come together because Satan will tempt you that word incontinency is a very common word. It means lack of self-control. Now, is that an excuse? You can say, well, I just couldn't control myself. Well, the truth of the matter is you can't control yourself. The Holy Spirit of God lives within us as a Christian, and you can control. He, he will control you. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't care how spirit-filled you are or how spiritual you are. You put yourself in the wrong situation. And God says you can't control yourself. There's only one man in the Bible that demonstrated such self-control, and that was Joseph. And I tell you what, you can say what you want to say about Joseph, and I've heard people try to paint him as, a, as, you know, as messing around, but he was in a situation where he had to be there. And Potiphar's wife came in, and uh, she had come on to him multiple times. And Joseph said no. And, and this was, no doubt, this was a beautiful woman. The kings and the pharaohs, they didn't get 
the ugly girls. They got the prettiest ones that they, the, in the place, the most desirable women. And she came to Joseph and said, lie with me. And he refused. And he ran away. But before he could run away, she grabbed and pulled his coat and ripped his coat. And then she appealed to the people and said he came in and tried to force himself on me. There's a story in the Bible about a, a, a brother, a half-brother, that he fell sick, the Bible said, for his own sister, Amnon, and he, he wanted his sister, Tamar. And he, he got sick wanting it. You say, you, you mean that's in the Bible? I'm not making it up. It's in 1 Samuel chapter number 12 or 13, or 11, 12, 13. Uh, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing, but you can read the story. And uh, so his, his friend, Amnon's friend, tells him how to how to lure his sister in so that he can force himself on her. The Bible says after her, afterwards he hated her. He despised her. That girl spent the rest of her life bewailing her virginity that was stolen from her by her own half-brother. Eventually her full brother took upon himself that which his father wouldn't do, and killed that Amen. rapist. Amen. That's Bible. And when David, when he did that, David was eased about it, but it, it messed that boy up because he had to do what his daddy wouldn't do. Right. You see, it's a it sin when it's finished bringeth forth death. How many lives have been ruined? How many more have to be ruined? How many lives have to be destroyed? Hey, how, how long is it going to be before some preacher stands up and quits beating around the bush and starts standing in the pulpit and saying to people, this is the way God said to do it? You say, Christianity, I had a fellow say to me one time, and uh, I, I, I'm trying to think, I, I want to say it in the, in the kindest way, but this was a grown man and uh, he said, I didn't think Christians were allowed to enjoy uh, marital relations. He said, I didn't think you were allowed to enjoy physical relations. I said, man, where do you get that stuff from? What a, what a crazy thing. What a crazy world that we live in. God, God ordained the relationship of husband and wife. Satan tries to tempt and tries to allure and tries to destroy, and nobody will stand up and tell you. I can count on my hands the number of preachers that I've heard in my lifetime growing up that told me and warned me against this stuff right here, that preached about it. Nobody ever said anything. Look what the Bible said. He said, Defraud ye not the one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Man, that's an amazing thing. He said in verse number 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. He's saying to the people, he said, listen, uh, don't, uh, he's not saying when he says burn, he's not saying to get yourself in a relationship where you've got to get married. He's saying, to the people, it's better it's better to be married than it is to uh, than, than 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 to destroy yourself and to destroy your life. He's saying, don't don't get in that situation. He said here. He said, but if in, but if they cannot contain, verse number nine, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Amen. I told someone this week, we were talking, the culture of America is divorce. It's no big deal. Marriage is honorable and all. God intended for you to get married and stay married. I don't preach that to condemn anybody who's failed in that. I preach that because we got young people here that you, you need to understand. You don't just jump and say, well, I'm going to get married and try it out and see how it is. No, you, you know and you pray and you wait on God before you get married. But that don't mean you mess around in the meantime. Amen. Amen. Why is all this? Because the number one thing that's destroying our society is this thing of fornication. 
The devil pushes sexuality at people. You say, you think he really does that? I'm going to tell you something. I went to a Christian school. Not a big one. 40, 50 students. And at break time, the, the, the pastor's son and another boy had taken a book from the library. or no, A dirty book they got at a yard sale. And I'm a little fella. I'm 10, 11 years old. And took a cover from one of the books in the library, the Christian books, and put it over it. And at break time, we would sit on the, on the school race recess and they would read to me from that pornographic book. Listen, I'm telling you, that junk's out there. And you know, once it goes in, you can't ever get it out. I could stand right here tonight and tell you things that they read to me that will never leave my mind. There's a, listen, there's a world full of junk out there throwing that stuff at you. You know, Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a maiden? He said, well, you just can't help it. It's everywhere. You don't have to lust. Because you're only hurting yourself when you do. You've got to control yourself. He said, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she is pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And he goes on and talks about this thing. One whole chapter dedicated to the idea of marriage. But the central theme of this chapter is, you better control yourself. It's all throughout the Bible. David was the, God's greatest man. And one day he looked out and he saw Bathsheba bathing and he said, I'd like to have her. And he sent for her and he did. And you all know that story. Terrible, terrible. Why, why is it that we have to just keep repeating the same stuff over and over and over again? You know, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. You know, we're just supposed to be like him. We're not supposed to be like animals. We're not supposed to be like a, a dog that has no discernment. We're supposed, to be, we're supposed to pray and seek God and as Christians. We're supposed to abstain from those things that are wrong. We ought not to just to dive into everything. And so from where I begin at fornication, let's see where it goes. I said you have one body, one flesh. You're supposed to take care of this body. The number one thing that destroys this body is fornication. The number two thing that destroys it is appetite. You see, fornication comes about because of an appetite, but the appetite, uh, the appetite that just says, boy, I just got to have, I got to eat, 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 got to eat. Jesus went 40 days without a bite of food. You say, I don't think I could do that. Well, I don't know. I, I hope God, I don't hope I don't have to, but I don't, know what, I don't know what might come about in the future. And the children of Israel, the first thing God did when he got them out of Egypt is he said, now listen, Moses. He said, I'm going to give you food to eat in the morning, and I'm going to give you food uh, for the evening. He said, you're going to eat when I tell you to eat. The people complained. They said, we'd like to go back to Egypt. They, they said, we, in Egypt, we had these things called flesh pots. You ever wonder what in the world is a flesh pot? It was a, a seething uh, cauldron where you could just go by and get a bite to eat anytime you wanted to. Anytime, anytime you had this least little urge, it's kind of like your pantry at home or my pantry. Full of snacks, you know. Up where we know right where the Oreos are, we know right where the Doritos are, and we know right where all the junk is. And if that don't work, we know where McDonald's is, and we know right where Wendy's is, and we know right where Taco Bell is. And now even, dude, we can even Grubhub it. <laughs> we don't even have to leave the house. I mean, we can just call it in. I mean, you know, it used to be a, a big deal. I mean, growing up. We know we had pizza every once in a while. Mom would make pizza. That was a big deal. We would get in a little in a little bag of powdered mix. Y'all remember those little things? And uh, man, we'd make pizza because we didn't eat pizza very much at our house. My dad wasn't a big pizza person, but every once in a while, you know, mom would throw caution to the wind and make a pizza. 
And there was a pizza hut in town, but we didn't go there because they sold alcohol. Can you imagine that? And we didn't even have an independent fundamental hellfire and damnation Baptist preacher. I just, mom and dad didn't go to that pizza hut. I went, when I drive past it, I was afraid to look at it. I thought I'd sin and I'd drive past a pizza hut like that because they sold beer down there. And we didn't go down there. But there was a Geno's, and every once in a while, we would buy Geno's pizza. Man, that's, a, I mean, you get in the car with that, ah, you could, we'd usually have the whole pizza eat by the time we got home. I mean, that was a big deal. We didn't go out and eat all the time growing up. I mean, it was a big deal to get a McDonald's cheeseburger growing up. But nowadays, people live in fast food restaurants, and we wonder why we're sick. We, 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 wonder, we, wonder why we're, we wonder why we're having to go to the doctors all the time. You say, are you against doctors? No, I'm not against doctors. I'm just against needing to go. I'm against having to go all the time. There are legitimate sicknesses, but I'm going to tell you something tonight. I'm being dead honest with you. You got one body. You got one body. You can't get another one. When you destroy this one, you're done. I don't know how long God wants me to live. I'd like to live a long time. We were talking today about it. People in their 20s and 30s today can't even walk sometimes. Just pain, aches and pains all over the place. And, and some of them is from work. Some of them is from legitimate things. But some of it is just from people that just give up. Eat anything they want to eat. Don't have any reservation about it. The Bible says, I want to show you some verses now that I've got your attention. And the Bible says in uh, Matthew chapter 4, we read it, Then was Jesus led up the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Verse 2 says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Look at Matthew chapter 21, verse number 18. I want you to see again. Matthew 21, 18. Matthew 21, 18. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he what? He hungered. Look at Mark 11, verse number 12, if you would. Turn to Mark 11, 12. What I want you to understand is, is that if you give in to every appetite and every craving that you have, it will destroy you. It will destroy you. We just saw a young man this evening that the dope has destroyed his mind. Doesn't even know who he is. Doesn't know where he is. Just standing out on the street, just making all kinds. And it's a family member uh, uh, here. Family member to me. But dope has destroyed him. His mind. The Bible says... In Mark chapter number 11, look, look, and Jesus 11, verse 12, and on the morrow when, he, when they were come from Bethany, he was what? Is it a sin to get hungry? No, Jesus got hungry. It's, it's not a sin to get hungry. Matter of fact, I think, if anything, it's a sin not to get hungry. I, I think a lot of times we're guilty of never being hungry. We don't know what it's like to be hungry. We eat so much that we don't know what it's like to not be full. You know, you ever, you ever heard of um, is it gallbladder surgery? They take out, remove, you're going to, they're going to remove your gallbladder. You ever wonder why do you have one for if they're going to take it out? Well, you, it'll, it won't hurt you. You can live without it. But Jim, you know this stuff better than I do. But you could, you, you don't, they say you don't need your gallbladder. You ever wonder about that? I mean, why does I have one? I mean, it seems like a pretty significant thing. Well, I checked it out one time and found out that God put in us a thing called a gallbladder, and it actually holds food so that if you go a couple days without food, it's a reserve tank. The reason why they tell you you don't need it is because we never go without food. We're just piling it in all the time. I mean, we're just eating all the time, so we don't need that, they say. You just don't need it. The reason we don't need it is because we never let our bodies get empty. We never get hungry. It's a good thing to get hungry every once in a while. Fasting is not a bad thing. I don't know that we ought to take 
something spiritual called fasting and only make it a diet plan. That bothers me some. There's a time when we fast, but, the tr but fasting too, let's separate it from the spiritual and let's just talk about the fact that this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost and fasting is going without food. You ever heard of breakfast? Yeah. You know what that is? That's when you're breaking your your fast. It's a, it's a good thing to let your body go without food and get hungry. It's not a sin to be hungry. The Bible talks about Jesus being hungry. And, and he even, if I can say so, he was even a little bit angry when he was hungry. Look at the next verse. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. I mean, when you see a fig leaf, I studied this, if a fig tree has leaves, then it means it has fruit. And Jesus said, aha, there's a fig tree up there. I'm hungry. I'm going to eat. And he, he, he had an appetite, and he went happily. He was looking forward to it. And the Bible says that when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the times of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, and his disciples heard it. Now, there's a, spiritual con, con, uh, uh, there's a spiritual teaching there, but the truth of the matter is, Jesus cursed that tree because he, it was supposed to have fruit on it, not because he thought and didn't know it, but it was supposed to have fruit. It advertised that it had fruit because it had leaves, and if a fig tree had leaves, it's supposed to have fruit. And when it got there, it was a liar, and Jesus got angry, and he cursed it. He said, no man eat fruit from you again anymore. I mean, it's not a sin to get hungry. It's not a sin to want to eat. But I tell you what, if we don't control our appetite, it'll destroy us. It's not a sin to get married to someone you love. It's not a sin to, uh, to have physical relation with your husband or your wife. Matter of fact, God says, I give you that appetite. I give you that desire. He says, don't, in the book of, in the book of Song of Solomon, it says, don't, don't stir up my love before it's time now. I could, I could go in and teach you a lot about that and talk about that, but listen, don't, don't, don't get me thinking too far ahead now. Let's stay within the parameters of, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He's saying, now keep, keep your distance. Keep it calm now. Why? Because you have appetites. You have control issues. If you don't want to eat, don't be around food. If, you don't, if you're not going to fornicate, then don't put yourself in a position to fornicate. I'm talking about control. I'm talking about appetites. God says, here's a married couple. He said, and they fast from physical relation. He said, you set a time when you come back together, lest Satan tempt you for your incontinency. Why? Because inherent nature is that we cannot control ourselves. I believe that when the Lord fasted, he was saying, showing to us that he had a physical body like we do. The first thing Satan said was make these stones into bread. Get you something to eat. You know, Jesus ate, but he wasn't going to eat because his eyes told him to eat. He wasn't going to eat because his belly told him to eat. You can't let your flesh tell you what to do. You have to let your spirit tell. Man's a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. You know, most people get all their orders from their body. You know, what's sad is this body is the part that's decaying, that's falling away and rotting away. The soul of man, the Bible says, shall never die. And the spirit, that's the part of us that's made alive when we get saved. And we're supposed to feed the spirit. I'm not, I don't use illustrations like this to sound spiritual, but... When I, was in, when I was in Indiana, I was in Bible college, I would, uh, we had breakfast in the morning. And I didn't always like their breakfast, but I was hungry. 
And every once in a while, they'd have biscuits and gravy, and that was okay, but I hated them because they'd only give me a little bit, and I wanted to reach across there and smack them. I thought, those, girls, those poor girls working that line will never get married because they've starved more men to death than any. I mean, give me one little old biscuit and a little old, and I mean, and then every once in a while, they'd say, hey, we got more if you want more. Man, that was a good day. And give us pancakes, little old pancakes that big, and two of them on a plate, you know, just enough to make you hungry, but it was good. And, uh, but I made a rule that unless I got up and read my Bible and talked to God, I wasn't going to eat. I would use that time. For, you say, that's dumb. No, that's not dumb. That's just the way it is. But I want to tell you this. I'll tell you where I learned to pray. I'd hear people say, well, I just don't have any time to pray. I don't have any time to walk with God because there's always somebody around. But the, but the Lord showed me something once that after our last class of the day, everybody rushed to the dining hall to eat. No one was in my room then. No one was around then. One day the Lord said, this would make a good time to pray, wouldn't it? So literally, I used to stand at my window and watch the people go to eat, and my body wanted to eat. My flesh, I wanted to eat. My belly was growling. I wanted to go eat. But some of my sweetest times of prayer ever, and God answered there was a man we went to school with named Mr. Pierpont, an old, aged man, but he had a, a spina bifida. He had a hole in his spine, and he was in real bad shape. And I remember praying and begging God to heal that man. And you know I think God did? I think God answered my prayer. I used to pray up there, and I would think, you know, God, someday I'm going to have a family, and uh, I'm going to need you to feed them. And I'm hungry right now. And I, God, I, I know that you feed, I know you take care of us, but I don't want them to go hungry. And I would pray and I'd say, God, teach me to trust you. And God, teach me to learn about your provision. Let me show you some verses about that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 27. Listen to this verse. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Look what it says. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when i have preached to others i myself should be a castaway you say what does that verse mean it literally means that paul's saying that my body doesn't tell me what to do you you have no idea what kind of man paul was and i neither do i i can't even comprehend the kind of man that paul was but i know that paul was beaten paul was shipwrecked there was times that Paul didn't, he missed lunch a few times. There were times he missed supper. But he just kept on going. There was one time the whole city pummeled him, tried to beat him. The Roman soldiers saved his life. And instead of lamenting his wounds and, 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 and they were leading him up and taking him into the building, Paul said, wait a minute, before you take me in, fellas, I want to preach a minute. And can you imagine this preacher, this preacher, Paul, standing there and the city had just been beating him and and it was such a savage beating that the roman soldiers thought what kind of a rascal do they have pinned down there and it took a legion it took several roman guards to pull those angry jews off of paul and then instead of getting mad or upset or hurting man he just would you someone said well maybe he didn't feel pain he felt pain he, he hurt but he, keep, he said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. He said, my body is not going to tell me when to get up. My body is not going to tell me how to behave. It's not going to do it. He said, and my fear is that if I let it, I'll become a castaway. Look what the Bible says in uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 11. Dearly beloved... 1 Peter 2, 11, I beseech you. That means I beg you. 1 Peter chapter 2, 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from what? Fleshly lusts, which do what? War against the soul. Whose language is that? Is that, is that the language of a preacher that's just trying to be meddlesome and aggravating? That's God. He said, abstain from fleshly lusts, which do what? Man is a what? He's a three-part being, body, soul, and spirit. And he says, abstain from the, your fleshly lusts because they war against your 
soul. This flesh is temporal. Why in the world does the temporal get to decide for the spirit, the, the eternal? Shot not to be that way. Let me show you. Look at look at some other verses. Um, look at First Timothy six eight. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse number 8. Let's look at verse 6, first of all. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. The word contentment just means glad for what you got. Verse 8, 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Verse 8, And having food and raiment, let us be there with, content now, i don't want to get into diet and so forth but you know there was a time when people grew up i mean and i mean they'd say what are we having for tomorrow pinto beans how many of you grew up on pinto beans i mean hey nothing wrong with that pinto beans and fried taters i mean you you don't have to get complicated jessica would break make uh green bean casserole and dad she'd say how you like that and dad well, I, he said one thing i can't say but he would he would he called it exotic food he said jessica's always making that exotic food you know because it wasn't it wasn't what he was used to but uh just having food and raiment let us be content therewith galatians five twenty four says this and they that are christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust affections and lust now i'm not making this up galatians 5 24 says they that are christ have cruci- they that are christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust now let me give you a verse genesis 48 15 This is Jacob. Jacob wrestled with this stuff, but look what the Bible says. And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk. What did he say? What was his testimony of God? The God which fed me all my life long unto this day. What what more can you ask for? God will feed you. Look at this verse here, if you would, um, if I've got it here, if if I saved it in my notes. Let's see here. Well, let's just let's just skip ahead one last place, and I'm done tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter number ten. I said there were three or four things, and I could name more things. I'm not trying to make a list tonight, but fornication. Adultery, fornication, sexuality, loose, loose morality, morals, is, is destroying our health, our society. It, the diseases that we have in our world are not accidents. There's no purpose for that. God says that those sins are against the body. You do that, you're destroying your body. Then the appetites and the, the eating. And the, just any time I, well, I just got to eat, I just got to eat, eat, eat. And, and, and we're eating ourselves to death, literally. We're destroying ourselves with our appetite. And then I probably would say that probably, probably next in there is the fact that we don't rest well. We just don't sleep like we're supposed to. We, I mean, we've got it so that we can, we got the, you know, we can just stay up all night long and, and uh we, ought, we need to rest. God ordained rest. And sometimes the only rest some of you get is when I'm preaching. But that's okay. I, w- I want you to be healthy. Amen. But now listen. Look at this verse here. Brother Jeremy's preached on this once at camp. And I, 
I've heard it, I've, I've mentioned it, Ecclesiastes chapter number 10, verse number 15. I wanted to include this passage in there because it's not mentioned very much. The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Now verse 16, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Isn't that weird? Where in the world is God talking about? Woe unto the old land when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. Verse number 17 says, Blessed art thou, old land, when thy king is the son of nobles and thy princes eat when? In due season. For what? And not for what? Now the word drunkenness doesn't just mean boozing it up. It, it, it means it means. Your body is controlled. Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The thing about drunkenness is, or booze, is a man says, I can control my booze, but it'll control you. He says, if you be a man given to appetite, he said to put a knife to your throat. You know what happens? People say, I can control my appetite, and so you just keep eating and eating and eating, and that's all you want to do is eat just... You say, well, it makes me feel better. It's comfort food. It's drunkenness. I will seek it yet again. Doesn't matter if it gives me indigestion. Doesn't matter if it gives me heartburn. Doesn't matter if I'm constipated. Doesn't matter if it what doesn't matter if it gives me the diarrhea. Doesn't matter how sick it makes. Doesn't matter if it gives me gall stones. Doesn't matter if it's giving me cancer. Doesn't matter if it makes if it if it kills me. I'm just going to keep doing it again because I like it. Now I'm not trying to be some kind of a health Nazi. I'm just telling you that it's not a matter what you eat. It's a matter if your food controls you and you're, you're just as worse as an alcoholic. Right. Drunkenness. Amen. And that's what he said here. He said, here's some people that they just get up and the first thing they do is just start eat, 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 eat. He's not talking about just eating breakfast. He said, woe to the old land when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. They just, they just live to eat. That's all they want to do is eat. And, they, and it's not for a reason. He says, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat when? In due season. Why? For strength. For strength. I think, Chris, when you guys told me about a fellow, maybe some, that he would have people come over and when they have not come work for him, they'd, they'd have breakfast. And if a guy didn't eat enough or whatever, he wouldn't even... I don't know who told me that story, but he was talking about having breakfast. But I've I've heard I've heard stories about these these old farmers. They'd have breakfast, and they'd have biscuits, and they'd eat a biscuit, you know, and some good good hearty breakfast. And then they'd take another biscuit and wrap it up and put it in their pocket and keep it with them. And they would eat that if they got a little hungry. They'd have that biscuit in there, just give them some strength to keep going until they could eat again. Man, I remember growing up. And uh, we'd be in the winter time, or the fall of the year, we'd be splitting wood. And I was telling the boys about this the other day. Dad, we'd, we'd get wood, and Dad didn't quit until he was done. I, I, you know, I used to beg him. I said, Dad, we can do this tomorrow. Dad didn't believe in doing it tomorrow. You know what I mean? It, I mean, it didn't matter if you were, you had to, you know, Dad had that mentality, which is a good thing. But it was, all, it was, it was a little taxing on a little fella, you know. I mean, a hungry teenage boy, I mean. And I'm just thinking, man, I just want to, I just, I'm cold. But every once in a while, I'd catch wind that mom was making spaghetti. And man, that would keep me going. I could taste that spaghetti. I mean, I, I lived for that spaghetti. I knew, I knew that we were going to get finished. I, man, I was going to eat that spaghetti. Now, food's a good thing. But I'm going to tell you something. You let it control you. You won't get anything done. You'll, you'll, it'll, it'll just. God ordains sex. It's inside of marriage. Don't, I mean, you don't have to scribble up when I say that. God ordained that. But people with loose morals that just behave carelessly, they destroy themselves. 
We see it in our society. It's the same thing with drunkenness. We look at the drunk, the, look at him, he's got to have his bottle. I remember when we had here a few years ago this derecho. You remember when all the power went out? We'd been working that day, and man, I'd gotten hot. It was so hot, I got sick. And I said, I'm going to lay down a few minutes. It was in the evening time, and uh, we'd put a, we were just, I, I, the power went out, and I said, that's okay. I laid down, and when I woke up, I, I, you know, I knew something was wrong. And I, I had a cooler up here at the church, and a big cooler, so I said, I'm going to go get that cooler because I think the power is going to be out for a little while. And I couldn't find ice. I, I was until 1030 at night, and then I had to fight a lady to get the ice from the, you know, from the gas station in Kanawha City to get ice. And, but the thing I noticed, and I noticed it for days, I mean, some people's power was out for 14 to 20 days. But I noticed if there was a restaurant like the McDonald's in St. Albany, the line was wrapped around the restaurant the whole time. And I thought, you know, these people, if it wasn't for that restaurant, they'd die. I mean, they would die. You know what they told us whenever the, uh, they did all these lockdowns? They said, now, don't even cook. Just go to the restaurant. I mean, literally. You know, the essential essential businesses were all the, were the, were the restaurants, the drive-through restaurants, and, and it just it just gotten worse and worse and worse. And so tonight, I come to you to tell you that if it's an amazing thing, Jesus knew what it was to get hungry. He lived in a body like us. It's not a sin to get hungry. But it's a sin to let your appetites control you. Amen. And we ought not to let our appetites control us. Whatever that is, we have, to, we have to be in control of those things. And we can't let them control us. And you can't control them by yourself. You put your, don't matter how spiritual you are, you put yourself in the wrong situation. And temptation is going to get the best of you. But God said, you, there are some parameters. And so he said... To this couple, he said, you agree for a time, then come together. That's a biblical principle trying to keep them from getting in trouble. He said, Satan will tempt you for your lack of control, your incontinency. And what God is saying is, don't trust yourself. Don't get in that situation. So you set parameters, biblical parameters, God said, where you don't do that. But lest you think I'm nuts, sin when it's finished bringeth forth death. And our society is eating themselves to death. Our society is fornicating itself to death. As a believer, I don't just want to... I want to be a good testimony as a believer. Amen? And uh, I want, with God's help, to take care of the body that I have, the temple of the Holy... I, I want to... If God lets me live to be an old man, and I'm getting closer every day... Then, then I want to be as productive and helpful as I can be. Now, some of you can go on, ignore what I say, behave however you want to, but you'll see in the end. Amen. You'll, you'll see in the end. Sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Dear Heavenly Father, this is not, as they, the disciples said, a hard saying. A lot of folks, this is not what we really want to hear, but Lord, we need to hear it. God, I need to hear it. I wish someone would have preached it to me more growing up. Lord, we laughed at fellas. They made fun of fellas like Lester Roloff and those others that talked about it. But uh, Lord, whether it be the, our appetites for food or our, our physical appetites, Lord, that, that, that are left unchecked and the licentious living, dear Lord God, the the fornication, adultery, and all the wickedness that goes on in our society, dear Lord, help us, dear God, to subject ourselves to you and to your word and to the principles of your word. And God, help us, Lord. Uh, pray for young men in this church and young ladies of character and principle. Not, not proud, not haughty. Lord, the Bible says,